Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program, Ronald Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative 40 Years Later. Please welcome Patty Jane Geller, Senior Policy Analyst in the Heritage Foundation's Center for National Defense. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to all those who joined us in person and all of, all of those who are joining us virtually. It's so cool to be here at the Heritage Foundation for the 40th anniversary of President Reagan's famous speech on his Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. Heritage has been a champion of missile defense since its initial involvement with Reagan's program, which we're going to talk about in detail today. So let's start us off. Uh, we're going to play a short clip of Reagan's address to the nation on this day back in 1983. Let me share with you a vision of the future which offers hope. It is that we embark on a program to counter the awesome Soviet missile threat with measures that are defensive. Let us turn to the very strengths in technology that spawned our great industrial base and that have given us the quality of life we enjoy today. What if free people could live secure in the knowledge that their security did not rest upon the threat of instant U.S. retaliation to deter a Soviet attack, that we could intercept and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. I know this is a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished before the end of this century. Yet current technology has attained a level of sophistication where it's reasonable for us to begin this effort. It will take years, probably decades, of effort on many fronts. There will be failures and setbacks, just as there will be successes and breakthroughs. And as we proceed, we must remain constant in preserving the nuclear deterrent and maintaining a solid capability for flexible response. But isn't it worth every investment necessary to free the world from the threat of nuclear war? We know it is. Great, and now I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Jim Carafano, the Vice President for the Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy here at Heritage to introduce the topic for us. So if for those who don't know the history of why this would be a special place uh, for Heritage in a special time, Heritage was the sponsor of, of a group that's called the High Frontier, which were a group of defense experts that initially came together completely outside of government to uh, to to uh, promote the uh, develop and promote the idea of, of missile defense. What's remarkable about that is is as we forget now as we look at the multi-building heritage here that the heritage at the time was still a very fledgling organization and for them to kind of put their faith uh, to carry this message which really had to get to the president to get done is really extraordinary. It's an extraordinary history, extraordinary accomplishment and it and to me it just reminds of, of the three lessons that I just think are so important for us today and the challenges that we face right now going forward. You know, one is the power of civil society. I mean, the fact that there are independent institutions uh, outside of the controls and money of government or industry or anybody else who can think about just on the question of what is best for the American people and independently provide independent advice and ideas is so powerfully and important and valuable to this country we would not have missile defense today without institutions like that, and we'll, we won't meet the challenges of the future without institutions like that. So to have Heritage and other, other foundations that, that do this kind of independent thinking, I think is a reminder of how really important that is. I think the second one is dealing with the challenges of bureaucracy. If you know the history of SDI, the, the main opponent of SDI was the Pentagon, which in itself and, and proved incapable of really dealing with this challenge of being new and creative and innovative in, in major different ways. And I think this is a challenge that we face today as we look at Congress and, and, uh, and, uh, and how we do defense policy and defense processes that, that the system just is, ossifies itself. And we have to find ways through leaders and bold new ideas to break through this and get reforms that really keep up with the strategic challenges that we face. And the third is politics. I think it's incredible and now in retrospect to think that Missile defense at its birth was a hyper-partisan idea. If you were a Republican and a conservative, you thought it was good. If you were a liberal and a Democrat, you thought it was bad. And you know, Ted Kennedy famously labeled it Star Wars, which at the time was meant to be a very derogatory idea. And it, it gets to this kind of fatuous notion that what's right or wrong for this country should be based on our politics. 
and not on our national interests. And I think today, as we live in the hyper-partisan world that we do, and when Republicans and Democrats tend to be for or against things, depending on who's who's for or against them, and, and we're not starting with the fundamental question of what is in the best interest of the American people, that we start foreign policy and defense policy from exactly the wrong place. So for all the reasons that we have missile defense today, and we've made this incredible progress, and we had these incredible opportunities to go forward, um, the magic that made that happen would, 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 is because there were people in Washington, D.C. who were bold enough to argue we need to do something differently and willing to put the political and the personal uh, and their own reputations behind doing that. And I think that's a powerful lesson for us. And we have such a distinguished panel for you here to talk about that. And it's, I, I think, the most important thing, and I really applaud PJ for putting this together, is this is not about history. The most important thing that we talk about today from what happened 40 years ago is about the magical lessons that we should learn on how to survive the future. So PJ, thank you for organizing this, and I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thanks so much, Jim. And now I'd like to invite our panelists uh, to join me on stage here for our moderated discussion. Great, so now we're gonna move on to our uh, panel discussion. We have a couple of really esteemed uh, panelists here with us today with uh, a diverse background who will uh, provide us with what I think will be a rich discussion on this topic. Uh, so first here we have uh, Ambassador Robert Joseph, former Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, and currently a senior scholar at the National Institute for Public Policy. He has a wealth of experience working in and out of government on nuclear deterrence and missile defense policy, uh, and we're honored to have someone on our panel with uh, this much expertise. And then we have Major General Fran Mann, a career air and missile defense officer who served 34 years in the US Army. He was the director of test at the Missile Defense Agency and completed his Army career as the director of strategy, policy, and plans uh, for NORAD US Northern Command. His operational experience will be really valuable for our discussion. So I've asked both of our panelists to start us off with some opening remarks on this topic, um, and then we're going to move into a, a question and answer discussion. So if you're uh, joining us virtually, um, feel free to submit your questions at any time during the event. And if you're here with us in person, you can start thinking of your questions as well. Um, so with that, um, Bob, I'd like to invite you to you. head over to the podium and uh, start us off. Thank you. Jim, uh, Patty, Jane, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be with you this morning and for the kind introduction. I commend the Heritage uh, Foundation for sponsoring this event to examine and assess the record of achievement toward the goal that President Reagan established 40 years ago. What I'll do is first talk a bit about the speech and then address how and why, in my view, both Republican and Democrat administrations have failed to achieve what Reagan envisioned. I remember hearing the speech as I was waiting at Dulles Airport for a delayed flight to Brussels, where in my first job in government, I was working as the nuclear planning officer at the US mission to NATO. And I must concede that my initial thought in hearing the speech was very selfish. It was basically how hard was it going to be for me to convince our allies to support what was clearly a fundamental different way of thinking about nuclear policy and deterrence. It was two years later after returning to what became a series of policy positions in the Pentagon that I truly understood the importance of the speech, a speech that not only turned decades of conventional thinking on its head, but one that pointed the way to construct a more effective deterrent, and if deterrence failed, a means to protect the American people from nuclear attack. To appreciate the innovative, in fact, the revolutionary nature of the speech, I think it needs to be placed in the context of the time. The years 1983 and 1984 were some of the most dangerous years of the Cold War. We were locked in a global ideological struggle with the Soviet Union. We were beginning to deploy Pershing II missiles and ground launch cruise missiles in Western Europe to counter the deployment of SS-20 missiles that were intended to sever the deterrence of our NATO allies from our own country. Moscow was issuing threats of nuclear war. 
Our allies, especially the five basin countries, were besieged by millions of their own citizens protesting the NATO deployments, protests that were abated by Soviet propaganda and Soviet money. There was never a more important time for U.S. leadership and U.S. resolve. It's also necessary to take into account President Reagan's personal views of the Soviet Union and the threat that it represented to our very survival. For Reagan, this was a historic struggle. It was a struggle of good against evil. He saw the Soviet Union as evil domestically and abroad. At abroad, the Soviet uh, Union held the nations of Eastern and Central Europe captive through repressive puppet regimes and military occupation. Domestically, uh, the Soviet system brutalized its own people with a history of mass killings, mass deportation, and a medieval gulag complex incarcerating tens of thousands of political prisoners. For many in the media and the national security community, Reagan's view was seen, even ridiculed, as overly simplistic, as naive, and as dangerous. But for Reagan, the means to respond to the Soviet threat was not through detente or somehow managing the relationship. It was much more direct. And I think many of you can recall his comment, and I quote, here is my strategy on the Cold War. We win, they lose. And only a few years later, we did win, in large part because of his leadership and vision. The underlying reason motivating Reagan's critics was his rejection of deeply ingrained conventional wisdom. In reality, dogma that had dominated U.S. strategic policy and programs since the advent of nuclear weapons. What had become articles of faith within the national security community concerning the virtues of mutual vulnerability, Reagan rejected on both moral and strategic grounds, and this was nothing short of apostasy. Morally, he stated that we should not risk the existence of our nation on the notion of mutual assured destruction as the final rung on the escalation ladder, which he termed a suicide pact. Yes, we needed to deter war, but not by mortgaging our future to an untested and highly dubious proposition. He thought it was immoral that we would fail to protect the American people from nuclear annihilation. Reagan also rejected the strategic concept at the very center of U.S. deterrence policy as codified in the 1971 ABM Treaty. That is, that stability, however one wants to define that elusive concept, is derived from both sides renouncing the defense of their territory and their population from nuclear attack. This logic, if one can call it logic, was based on the seductive notion that if one side attempted to defend itself, the other side would build more offensive missiles, and the result would be a nuclear arms race. This became canon law in the arms control community that lasts until today, despite the facts having proven it to be false. And Reagan knew it was false, as he witnessed that the most fevered arms race with the Soviet Union took place not before the ABM Treaty, but after the ABM Treaty went into effect. The facts supported Reagan, but to paraphrase Maxwell Scott of the Shinbone Star, when legend is more convincing than the facts, stay with the legend. On this point, one should never underestimate the staying power of bad ideas in our national security community. In his speech, Reagan displayed the optimism that characterized his domestic and national security agendas. In establishing the Strategic Defense Initiative, he called on America's science and technology greatness in the private and public sectors to embark on a broad-based research program with the goal of ultimately developing and deploying defenses that, were, that would render nuclear weapons obsolete. An incredibly bold idea. He knew it could take years, perhaps decades, to develop the means to defend our nation from ballistic missile attack, but he challenged us to work to create a better, safer, and more secure world. So how have we done since uh, his speech to accomplish the vision that he set forth? At best, I think it's a mixed record. On the positive side, the technology side, we have today the ability to deploy an effective and affordable defense system, including in space, capable of protecting against North Korean-sized threats and sufficient to strengthen deterrence of Russian 
and Chinese coercive threats. Not to create an impenetrable shield, but to undermine the confidence of Russian and Chinese planners that they can conduct limited strike, strikes to coerce and blackmail us, whether in the context of Ukraine or Taiwan. Key technology sectors have undergone revolutionary transfer, transformation in the last 40 years in computation, in sensors, in lift, in directed energy, and in all areas needed to deploy advanced defenses. This part of Reagan's legacy has been achieved. Where we have failed is in the policy arena. If I had to choose one word to characterize the fluctuations in missile defense policies of the administrations that followed Reagan, it would be either bipolar or schizophrenic. The Bush 41 administration actively pursued SDI research consistent with Reagan's vision. Its program of record, GPALS, the Global Protection Against Limited Strike Program, called for a robust combination of space-based and ground-based capabilities. When the new Russian president proposed the Global Defense Initiative, President Bush offered GPALS as our contribution. But the Clinton administration immediately reversed course. Despite the end of the Cold War, despite calling Russia a partner, not an adversary, Clinton sought to strengthen the ABM Treaty, which he repeatedly referred to as the cornerstone of strategic stability. In other words, stability is based on the ability of each side, even if they're partners, to be able to annihilate the other, mutual assured destruction. And it was this legacy thinking that prompted the Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, on his very first day in office, to kill just about every homeland missile defense program he inherited, particularly GPELs. With Bush 43, there was a clear rejection of past thinking. The new president ran on the platform of withdrawing from the ABM treaty, and he did so. The reason was clear, and that was the rise of rogue states, including North Korea and Iran. The goal was to deploy defenses against limited attacks, and the goal was met in October of 2004 when IOC was declared for the GMD, the ground-based mid-course defense system. With the Obama administration, there was once again a return to legacy thinking. The third site in Europe was canceled, and the president was caught off mic, telling his Russian counterpart that after his re-election, he would be much freer to make concessions on strategic defenses. In other words, defenses were little more than a bargaining chip to encourage Russia to negotiate further offensive reductions. Just contrast this with President Reagan walking away from the Reykjavik summit without an agreement because of Gorbachev's demand that he abandoned SDI. President Trump, in unveiling his administration's missile defense review, announced that the United States intended to build a defense capability to protect the American homeland, and I quote, against missiles anywhere, anytime, any place. But the review itself and his administration's program of record, the next generation interceptor, fell far short. The rhetoric was there, but the words did not match DOD policy or programmed capabilities. The Biden administration has brought us back to the past once again. The planned capabilities contained in his recent missile defense review will not, in my view, keep pace even with the North Korean threat and it specifically rules out defending against Russia and China. To sum up, we have failed to achieve Reagan's goal, not due to technology shortfalls or even to the lack of funding, but rather due to the failure of leadership. To fulfill Reagan's vision, we need a president willing to override the same legacy thinking that Reagan rejected four decades ago and willing to take on the institutional antibodies throughout the interagency especially in the Department of Defense and in Congress, that have consistently undermined an effective defense of our country from missile attack. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. Uh, and before I bring Fran up to the podium, I should mention that you know, the, the purpose of this event, uh, of course, is to talk about the history and the policy of missile defense, but I also wanted to use it to talk about uh, the future. You know, what do we have now of our, in our missile defenses, and what can we do to improve them? And you know, as, as many of you know, we only we don't have a Reagan def, uh, Strategic Defense Initiative deployed. We have a limited homeland system of uh, around 44 ground-based interceptors. So I've asked Fran to talk a bit about you know the status of our missile defenses now, and uh, what are some things we can do to to improve them. And, and with his uh, years of Army experience, um, he's going to have 
great things to share. So uh, Fran, why don't you come on up? Well, <clears throat> thank you, Patty, uh, Jane, and thank you, Tom. It's good to see you again. And thanks to Jim for the opener. And Bob, uh, thanks for painting the history and walking us to how we got here. Um, it's a great opportunity to be here as we reflect on President Reagan's decision to initiate SDI and to think about the future. You know, the history of Homeland Missile Defense actually dates back to 1957, and we had many starts and stops and reorientations in that effort as the global situation and environment changed and as policies changed and as technology came forward and enabled us to, to really provide for Homeland Defense capability. When you think of 1983, the Soviet Union was our primary adversary, and to use a current term, they were our pacing challenge. China was a distant second on that roster of adversaries, I think, at the time. North Korea required constant attention, but they weren't really a threat to the homeland. And I would categorize Iran as a nation in turmoil and a source of, of terrorist activity. But you fast forward to 2002, in the Bush administration, or George W. Bush's administration, the Soviet Union's dissolved. We're actually starting to do missile defense exercises with the Russians. China is clearly our economic competitor, but I think more focused on becoming a global economic leader versus direct confrontation with the US. Iran is recognized as a source of global or a sponsor of global terrorism, and clearly has a regional ballistic missile capability and a nascent nuclear program. And North Korea is the rogue, on a path to a nuclear weapon, on a path to ballistic missiles that can range the United States. So President George W. Bush's 2002 decision to create a viable but limited missile defense capability to counter a rogue nation threat was timely and appropriate. And over the past 20 years, that capability that we now know as ground-based mid-course defense, or GMD, has evolved and it has also matured. GMD's 44 interceptors and its two launch sites are focused primarily on a North Korean threat. It's really the, I'll say, the pacing threat for the system in my estimate. And the 2023 Missile Defense Review categorized North Korea's threat as increasing in scale and complexity. By 2030, the Missile Defense Agency plans to field the next generation interceptor, the GBI, or NGI, and that will provide 20 additional interceptors to the 44. So one question you have to ponder, if in five to seven years we have those 20 interceptors, will 64 be enough to deal with a rogue nation threat? In missile defense, we usually fire multiple interceptors against an inbound missile. So if you fire two or fire three interceptors against one threat, how long will you be in the fight? And what if we must contend with rogue nations, not a rogue nation? So numbers matter in missile defense, as does interceptor quality. And the NGI will give us greater improved performance out of the interceptors but quantity complements quality. And when you combine those attributes in a layered defense, your probability of success is greatly enhanced. A layered defense is a fundamental principle of air and missile defense operations. It allows for early engagement and successive engagements. Layers give you that opportunity for a second swing at the pitch, an opportunity to shoot, assess, and shoot again if necessary. And as we think about the future, we must ask, is it time to begin developing and implementing a true layered defense for the homeland? One other essential element that is critical for mission execution is an agile command and control system. Agile C2 provides an integrated sensor architecture which accurately depicts the current situation and which enables precise engagement. It provides battle aids to help with analysis and assessment of the situation and to generate defensive options for the commander to apply. A versatile fire control system that allows for rapid tailoring of the defense design and employment options. And Agile C2 truly enables and optimizes the benefits of a layered defense. Quality, quantity, layers, Agile C2 are essential to ensuring that vision of 2002 provides a viable solution today and into the future. And as we think about today, China is our most consequential strategic competitor. They are our pacing challenge. And Guam is key to any operations we conduct in the Pacific. Russia's priority is reestablishing a position on the world stage by dominating it former nations of the Soviet Union. 
North Korea has ICBMs and is nuclear capable. And it fires missiles of all varieties on a regular basis. More than 70 last year. I think we're approaching 20 this year. Iran has a credible ballistic missile capability, a space program that could translate into an ICBM program, as North Korea's did, and an active nuclear research effort. And we must recognize that the threat is more complex than ever. The ballistic missile is not the only threat to the homeland. The homeland is also at risk from long-range cruise missiles and long-range unmanned aerial systems. So as we think about our adversaries and we think about our priorities and where we should head in the future, I would contend countering North Korea's ballistic missile threat is important as we posture to counter our potential threat from Iran. Countering China's adventurism in the Pacific by developing a robust air and missile defense for Guam is important, and then populating that defense to other regions too. And focusing on Russia's air and cruise missile threat to the homeland is something we cannot ignore. So it's about countering air and missile threats as we think about 2030 and beyond. And that's going to require a new family of sensors. That's going to require an integrated and layered air and missile defense architecture. That's going to require an agile command and control system. And it's going to require an increase in air and missile defense force structure as well as materiel. In some respects, we've completed a circle. And it's back to the future when we examine the threats and the risks from the third dimension. It's 1983 again, time for a bold decision to put us on a path to countering the air and missile threats of a different type to the homeland. We must evaluate and consider the cost of building a defense that will deter and defend against an attack versus the cost of doing nothing. I look forward to the discussions. Excellent. Thanks so much, Fran. Um, based on both your remarks, I have a lot of questions and a, a lot of great uh, material to, to discuss. So I'm going to uh, jump right in. And um, Bob, I'm going to go back to uh, some of the, the comments that you made. You talked a bit about the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty between the US and the Soviet Union. Um, and so uh, this treaty would uh, limited the, the US and the Soviet Union to just uh, 100 uh, um, missile interceptors each and also prohibited the development of testing of new systems. And so when Reagan uh, announced his SDI program in 1983, we were still part of the ABM Treaty, which clearly would have limited his plans. Uh, so I'm curious, do you have any thoughts? Why didn't, Reagan, why didn't Reagan withdraw from the ABM Treaty when he announced SDI? Just a footnote on the ABM Treaty itself. Provision 1, Article 1 of the ABM Treaty, prohibited both sides from developing and deploying any territorial defense, any defense of US, in our case, US territory and population. You could use those 100 interceptors, but they had to be used either to protect the capital area to, uh, to assure command and control in the nuclear war. This is the mindset. Or you could use it to protect a uh, ICBM field. We chose to protect a field in North Dakota. That was the strategic concept that we were working with that continues until today, basically, in, the, you know, in, in, in various components of the national security community. Why didn't Reagan get out of the ABM Treaty? Uh, clearly, uh, it would have been consistent with his view on the immorality of the strategic concept that was embedded in the treaty to get out of the treaty. I've got a lot of gray hair. Permit me one, one war story, OK? Uh, in, in 1988, I had returned to the Pentagon from Brussels. I had taken a number of positions uh, in OSD policy. And in 1988, I was the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Forces and Arms Control Policy, working SDI, working the ABM Treaty. The Assistant Secretary position was, ap w w was vacant as was the undersecretary position for policy. That left me the first person in line after the Secretary of Defense. The White House in 1988 calls for a National Security Council meeting on the ABM Treaty. Weinberger had just left. Carlucci was now, now the Secretary of, of Defense. This was my first national security uh, uh, a meeting ever. It was the last one that I attended until Bush 43. Reagan opens the meeting 
by saying, you know, the first thing, and he always did, a, I'm told, a lighthearted sort of introduction. He said, the first thing we ought to do is kick out all the lawyers, <laughs> which in a Washington meeting would have sort of decimated the, 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 all of those in the room. But uh, he didn't do that. And what happened is the, the, the discussion went immediately to sort of the broad versus narrow interpretation of the treaty. What can we do under the treaty in terms of pushing forward sort of the research uh, the research agenda of SDI. The State Department position was absolutely typical, uh, and it's one, it's a talking point that is often used. We agree, Mr. President, that we should get out of this treaty because, you know, you know, because, you know, your, your vision is inconsistent with it, but now is not the time. Our allies won't like it, the Soviet Union won't like it, uh, and, you know, we, we, we can just wait. We can do the research that we need to do by staying in the treaty. The intelligence community made the argument that, well, the Soviet reaction would be very negative. Uh, they had already walked out of the INF negotiations. Uh, and, you know, if we, if we abandoned the ABM treaty, there would be, you know, a, a, you know, a tremendously negative reaction by the Soviet Union. Others made the argument that Capitol Hill would be very, uh, w would object very strongly. Remember at the time we had Senator Levin and others who really believed that the ABM Treaty was at the center of our deterrent policy and should remain there forever. And so I think what happened was Reagan was convinced that we could continue the program. And this is 1988, this is the last year of his in office, uh, and that uh, you know, if, if he were to take action now, uh, there would be, there would be tr you know, significant negative consequences. Uh, I personally wish he would have gotten out, uh, but uh, he chose not to, and I think he chose not to because of the timing more than anything else. Cool, thank you. Um, and I, I wanna dig into something you mentioned there about the, the mindset of, of missile defense back then. And to me, it almost sounds like there was just an anti-missile defense uh, mindset because of, uh, this, this fear you talked about in your, in your speech of um, and, and causing an arms race or taking away um, Russia's or the U.S. Uh, second strike capability. And, you know, you still hear those arguments today. And, in fact, I've heard that um, it's U.S. missile defense that's been the driver of uh, Russia's and China's uh, recent nuclear missile buildup. Um, Bob, what do you think about that argument? Well, I think there are two components to that. One is that, as I mentioned in my prepared remarks, the facts don't support the, the view that, you know, if we deploy defenses, you'll have an arms race. I mentioned that uh, the, the most fevered aspect of the arms race with the Soviet Union, the nuclear arms race, came after the ABM treaty went into effect. So no defenses, arms race. Fast forward to 2002, and the United States withdraws from the ABM treaty. I checked again recently on the Putin's, uh, on the Kremlin site, the internet site, uh, is the Putin statement from the day that the U.S. withdrew. And what does Putin say? This is not a threat to Russia, and we are going to continue our offensive reductions. In other words, we're going to deploy defenses, and they're going to go down. So the facts, the facts really don't, don't match the, the, the concept, the conventional wisdom, the ingrained dogma, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that defenses are destabilizing. And the second aspect to that question, I think, is, you know, this concern about militarizing space, mm. okay? If we deploy, particularly if we deploy in space, it will militarize space. Militarize space, okay? Uh, what are the Russians doing now? What are the Chinese doing now? They have militarized space in a very aggressive manner. Uh, I'll, I'll do one more war story, and then I'll stop with the war stories. When I was undersecretary at the State Department, the Chinese in January of 2007 took down through a ballistic missile, uh, an ASAT, uh, they destroyed one of their own satellites. They tested an ASAT capability creating thousands and thousands of pieces of space debris. Uh, that was on a Friday. On a Monday, I had the uh, Chinese ambassador in my office. And he was literally shaking. 
I made them wait for a while, and you know, I mean, you just, you know, they, they play that game, and I thought I would play that game with them too. So he's waiting, and he comes in, and I said, Mr. Ambassador, you know, you have created all of this debris. You have, you have uh, tested an anti-satellite capability. What's your response? And he said, well, my country is against militarizing space. <laughs> I mean, the hypocrisy of it. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it's sort of an in-your-face because, you know, if you look at the origins of the term militarizing space, it really goes back to Soviet propaganda uh, and particularly you know, the talking points that they used time and time again at the Conference of Disarmament in Geneva. The problem is that a lot of, a lot of people on, on our side uh, have bought into this notion. You see it in, in, in some administration policies. You see it uh, up on Capitol Hill. But it's, 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 just a, it, it's just a silly notion. I mean, we understand, and our Defense Department has said, space is a contested environment. We've created a space force. What we need to do is deploy an effective missile defense capability that includes a space component, not just sensors, but killers, if we're going to have the type of capability that we need to defend not only against rogue states, but also to strengthen deterrence against Russia and China. I mean, Putin, how many times has he threatened the use of nuclear weapons over Ukraine? It's not a full strike. It's not sort of the need to create, as I said, an impenetrable shield. We need to be able to take out enough of their capability to induce into their thinking, into their war planners, that they can't achieve their objectives and threaten us for coercive and blackmail purposes. I'll stop there. So much more I want to unpack there, but uh, I'm going to switch gears and fast forward uh, 40 years to, to 2023. And uh, Fran, I want to ask you about the, the next generation interceptor, uh, the NGI, which is going to be the, uh, the capability the Pentagon is working on to upgrade uh, the current Homeland uh, missile defense system we have today. Um, you touched on your, in your remarks, we're eventually going to have around 64 interceptors, 20 of them NGIs. Um, but the, the threat is, is increasing, not just from North Korea, but potentially Iran. And uh, if, if you ask me, I don't think 20, the plan to buy 20 inter interceptors, NGIs, is, is going to be enough. Um, and we've, we've heard from the Biden administration that they don't, they're not interested in, in buying more than 20, at least now. Um, Fran, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think we're going to need more NGIs? And if so, do you see any benefits to, to making that plan now versus you know, waiting five years when the, the threat has gotten worse? Well, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I, I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, 64 is not enough. I don't know if it's 84. I don't know if it's 94. But six, just looking at the math, and, and we often think, you know, North Korea stopped testing for a period of time. Well, that's probably because they were in production, and they've been firing, and they fired two ICBMs, I think, this year, or two missiles have been categorized. Now. So it's what is his capacity, and then potentially what is another adversary's capacity. That's a numbers game and you need to think your way through that. Um, I would hypothesize, yep, let's get the first 20. Let's lay out a plan. Because at some point, even the GBIs, if you retain those, they're gonna reach obsolescence, and you're gonna have to replace them. Mm -hmm. So lay out that plan to start producing beyond 20, and, and have that discussion, and know what that budget looks like. And I think the 2023 NDA put that task on the department to come in with a plan. In addition to that, I. I really think we, we have to think our way through, you know, where should they be sighted? Hmm. And is it time to really make a decision? We need the third site and not just put everything at Greeley or Vandenberg, but consider the third site in the east. That enables layers. That enables a better uh, options going from a threat from like Iran. Mm -hmm. um, and it disperses, gives the commander options on how he's going to employ his weapon system. So I think it is time to develop that plan. Yeah. Start thinking about it and, and really start the dialogue on it because it takes time. We are seven years, six, six years into the construction of the new missile field at Greeley. That is the field where I believe the 20 NGIs will probably end up or the majority of them may end up up there. Okay, six years, it's not done yet. It takes time. And so if you're gonna build one in the east, then let's start moving the ball of get through the environmental stuff, get the uh, ability to do it, prep the site, and then you can slowly start the construction. 
six, seven years before we see the NGI, six, seven years before we see 20 additional interceptors, what will the adversary's inventory be in six or seven years? I, I totally agree with you. Um, and you, you mentioned the, the uh, FY23 NDAA, which called for a funding plan for uh, 64 NGIs. And I, I agree that's a good idea, because I, I worry that you know we buy 20 now, and then five years from now, we say, oh, we're going to need more, and then we have to go back to defense industry. Uh, and it's and not only will be will we be behind the threat, but um, there might be more costs in the in the long run to versus planning for it now. Am, am I right about that? What do you think? No, I agree. And, and what the unknown is is it 64 to replace the GBIs and right. add 20, or is it 64 additional in, a, in addition to the 44 GBIs and, and you hang on to them? That's an unknown variable in the, in the plan that's not been shared. But still, what would it take to get to 64? And, and timeline that out. Did you have something to add? Well, look, I, is the next generation interceptor more capable than the current ground-based interceptors? Absolutely, okay? More capable in many ways, including having, we are told from press reports, a multiple kill capability. But the threat is such that no matter no matter what we do in terms of ground-based and, and sea-based missile defense, it's not going to be sufficient. And you can't really scale uh, NGIs. NGIs are incredibly expensive. The ground-based system is incredibly expensive, much more so than if we were to go to space. And so I think we need to think about sort of that threat. Okay, what is that threat? North Korea? A large component of that, we certainly have to defend against North Korea, but how do you envision the North Korean th threat? I mean, Rand has come out recently with a projection that North Korea could have over 200 nuclear weapons in four years. They are aggressively pursuing ICBM capabilities. In the last parade, they had 11 Hwasong 17s uh, rolling, down the, rolling down the parade route. They had five canisters, which we are told, or which, which, which is, are speculated to be the next generation of solid-engined ICBMs, which has a real significance in terms of you know, our ability to defend against them because of the attributes of a solid versus liquid uh, missile capability. Just North Korea, I don't think with 20, with 20 NGIs and 44 uh, GBIs that we can defend even against the North Korean threat. I'm, I'm all for increasing the reliability uh, and effectiveness of the 44 that are in the ground today. We absolutely should be doing that. But is NGI the one that the, the program that we want to base our future missile defense on when we know it's not going to be sufficient? I mean, I think the only thing that's really preventing us from going to space is bad policy mm -hmm. decisions. And I think that's, that's where we require the presidential leadership, a new president, to come into office like President Reagan and do what President Reagan did. That was the inspiration of his speech. And that was the vision that I think we still need to reach for. So I'm going to come back to a follow-up question, but I want to go back to you, Fran, uh, quickly. You, know, you, you also mentioned the idea of an underlayer as a way to bolster our homeland missile defenses. And uh, you mentioned a third site that can, that can fill the role of an underlayer. Um, but I'm wondering, in, in 2020, uh, the Missile Defense Agency tested also um, one of the SM-3 Block 2A interceptors, part of the Aegis system, against an ICBM uh, to use as an underlay. Um, but we, we haven't actually made any progress since then, at least to my knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, what, what are your thoughts on either using this SM-3 system or um, more NGIs uh, for, for an underlay? I'd love to just hear a little bit more about this concept. You could use the, the two alpha missiles in an underlayer smaller footprint than a GBI or an NGI would provide as far as defended areas, so you'd have to have multiple sites across America. I mean, there's good logic in that. There was a two Bravo program back in the 08, 09 time that was really to develop a standard missile for Aegis that would be an ICBM capable, but it never got really off the early development because it was wouldn't going to fit in the vertical launch system. It was a different type of fuel that po posed hazards, and, and so the decision was made to, to terminate it. Um, but there's potential using an Aegis standard missile to provide that underlayer. Here again, 
multiple sites across the, if you wanted to defend the 48 mm -hmm. states, um, you'd have to have multiple sites. You could get a, a layer by putting NGIs in the east and fighting them with GBIs. I mean, it's about a decision. And, and as Bob says, it's about making a decision to, okay, we're gonna make a bold decision. We're gonna do something. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in, in my ideal world, we'd have enough money for a bunch more NGIs, uh, a whole separate underlay, and a and a layer of space-based interceptors. Um, but that could be a lot. But Bob, I want to go back to you. You know, you mentioned we need a bold decision to, like Reagan, to go back to uh, space for, for missile defense. And I'm just wondering, wh why haven't we had that? You know, we've had other Republican presidents. Um, is it that, you know, I've, I've certainly had read articles that say, uh, space-based interceptors are too expensive or they're technologically and, and feasible. You know, is, is that wrong? Um, what, it, what will it take to actually get this bold move, do you think? Well, as I pointed out in my prepared remarks, the revolution in technology over the past 40 years provides us with the ability to go to space. I, just, I, I don't think there's any question about that. And it's a lot cheaper than doing it with ground and sea-based, and it provides a benefit, a boost phase intercept, for example, which you're not going to get with, uh, with, with ground-based systems. The, 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 the issue is the threat, okay? Is it, is it just North Korea and Iran? Or can we cross sort of this mental barrier and, and you know, that pro prohibits us from thinking about dealing with the Russian and Chinese threats? And I'm not talking, as I said, of a large-scale attack. I'm talking about the type of coercive threats that they make. Okay, we've heard it from Putin on Ukraine. We are going to hear it in the future from Xi on Taiwan. D uh, can't we do what was, uh, what was originally the phase one requirements for SDI in the Pentagon, and that was have enough capability that we can destroy enough of their incoming missiles that they will not have confidence in their ability to conduct limited strikes? I'm all for that, and I think that as you look at the, th the, the threat projection, we have to be, we have to move in, in, in that direction. And, and Fran, what are your thoughts on uh, being able to defend at least from limited attacks by the Russian and the Chinese? You know, in your opening remarks, you talked about defending against the Russian um, uh, air, air threat. That, that, that's the dynamic as we, as we look today going forward and then some of the Russian doctrine, and look at where they developed. They signed the INF Treaty. They didn't put a lot of effort into ballistic missiles. They put a lot of effort into cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. And so with the, the cruise missile inventory they have today, they can stand well outside in international airspace and, and launch a limited attack if they wanted to strike a capital, strike an industrial air to send a message. Um, and, and that's where I go back to, it's no longer just missile defense. Hmm. It's air and missile defense. And I think the NORAD NORTHCOM commander would tell you, he's got concerns. Mm -hmm. that's what, and so that's it. And I don't think I can do that from space. I can probably do the ballistic missile from space, as, as you said. Um, but it's, now I got, I've got a different problem than I had in 1983. And I've got to figure that out. And I can't give a blanket cruise missile defense to the nation, probably. But select areas, yeah, or have the capability to move it where I think I need it. Hmm. And part of the reason here, I think, is because you know Russia, as you both mentioned, has been making these coercive nuclear threats as it wages its war in Ukraine. You know, if the U.S. can say, "Well, you're making these threats, but we can deny you those attacks if you were to actually uh, launch cruise missiles at us," then we're yeah ta taking away that option, right? Wrong? No, right. I mean, if if, if you look at President Biden's national security strategy published relatively recently. It says we're gonna do everything we can to strengthen deterrence against Russia and the, the type, you know, the, you know, coercive threats of the type that they've been making over Ukraine. Well, the principal thing that you can do is in the missile defense area, but they rule that out in the missile defense review. We do not defend against Russia and China. I mean, that's t entirely inconsistent in terms of strengthening deterrence on the one hand and avoiding sort of any uh, capability uh, or not, let me put it in a more positive way, uh, you know, not pursuing, uh, not pursuing a capability to deal with limited threats from, uh, from Russia and China. It just, it just doesn't make sense. 
Well, in the interest of time, I want to turn to our audience here, both in person and uh, the virtual audience, and see if we have any questions for our two panelists today. Got one over there. You mentioned space, weaponization of space. So the question will be more on where is America saying what we're allowed to do. I think Reagan would want to talk about a space shield, the ability to knock out satellites, maybe have a space gun that could target and knock out as a pulse weapon, like target electronics. So the imagination of Reagan would have been involved. And I'm just wondering, where would where is the uh, our policies on what we're allowed to put in space? You could have football-sized drones that could be space finds, thousands of them in one satellite. That could, so I'm just wondering, where are we allowing ourselves to have something in space, even as a defensive capability? I'll let you handle the policy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's first important to note that the only legal, restri legal restriction in terms of treaty prohibitions is the prohibition of deploying in orbit weapons of mass destruction. Okay. Now, I've had a number of experiences in which I have talked to general officers in this field who have remained convinced even years after we left the ABM treaty that we couldn't deploy killers in space, directed energy or, or what, you know, or, or, or the type of brilliant pebbles scheme that uh, uh, that was uh, uh, that was part that was part of GPALS. Uh, so we're not restricted legally. It's it's it, it, it's policy restrictions. Now, Bush didn't pers Bush 43 didn't pursue a space-based capability because the threat was different. This was. This was at a time in which North Korea was the threat. North Korea was a limited threat. Uh, and Russia was going to be, we thought, more of a partner, at most a competitor, but not an adversary. I would just ask you to go back and read President Bush's speech on 1 May 2001, his first address on national security. And it, 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 you know, it, it lays out sort of the, 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 the threat environment and what we're going to do about it. Get out of the treaty, deploy a limited capability. And that made sense at the time. But now we have a much more complex and much greater threat environment. So these old thoughts that we had, the old thinking, uh, just doesn't allow us to do what we need to do. Uh, but it is it is a policy failure, as I said, um, more more th more than anything else. And I think the only hope is we get a new president who comes in uh, and appoints the right people to pursue this to overcome the objections of the bureaucracy, whether it's state or the intelligence community or the or the Defense Department, and get this done. Otherwise, we're going to have you know a a ground-based capability and a sea caves capability that's better than today, but that's not sufficient to meet the threats we face. Excellent. Um, I'm going to, do we have any questions from our um, virtual audience? We do. Yeah, I'll take one right here. <coughs> Thank you so much. So uh, Mark Stone asks, and we've talked about this, should the United States make defense against Russia and Chinese missile attacks on the homeland an announced objective? And if so, should it be a defense against a limited number, say like a Red October kind of thing, or should it be against larger attacks? And then finally, Mark wants to know if it's the later, if it's major attacks, what are the budget implications of that? Well, from a from a policy aspect, yeah, I think we need to start thinking about China and Russia attacking the homeland. Whether it's ballistic missiles or cruise missiles can be the debate, and which would they apply? Um, Budget-wise, there's no free chicken. It's going to be expensive whether we go to space, whether we do it terrestrially. Um, but I, I think, you know, we need to begin the process and start having that dialogue. Great. Bob? Well, I agree. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of the budget implications, I think that it is very affordable to go to space. It's much less than trying to do it all from, from, from ground in terms of the number of interceptors that one, that one would deploy. I mean, just think of what Elon Musk has done to reduce the cost of launch, right? 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a small fraction of what it used to be. And we have made so much progress in so many critical areas of technology that we're at that point that we can do this and, and, and it's affordable. Uh, it's, it, it, once again, it's just, it's just the policy prohibitions uh, and, and the conventional wisdom uh, that, that we've, uh, that we've, that we've, uh, you know, we've seen over the course of decades that prevents us from doing that. And I'll just throw in there, you know, this, ad this administration has uh, said in its NDS that its number one priority is defending the homeland. And when it comes to the budget, and if you ask me if that's, if that's the number one priority, then you know, missile defense falls into that category as does nuclear deterrence or, or things that are worth funding, whether they're super expensive or not. Uh, we have time for one more question. So Michael Gleba from the Sarah Scaife Foundation asks, can you comment on the importance of non-governmental organizations like Heritage and NIP to be involved in these discussions, academic and, and in national defense policy in general? Great. Yeah, I think, you know, bringing the collective body together is important. Um, because it, as you said, you know, it, the foundation of our missile defense today stems from efforts by an organization like Heritage. And, and so there, there is a body of intelligence out there that ought to be brought forward and ought to be engaged in the, in the dialogue. Because you always get that one-off opinion or thought that somebody hadn't considered. And that becomes the catalyst to get a ball rolling. Bob, would you like the final word? I, I would just say that the last place I would look for innovation is in government. And that's coming from a civil servant who served for 27 years in government. That's the last place I would look. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, uh, I wish, honestly wish we had another hour for this because there's, to me, still so much uh, there to talk about. But it's been a, a really great discussion with, with the both of you. Uh, you know, and, and thanks to Jim Carafano as well. So thank you so much to you both. Uh, for being here today, for answering all of my questions, and uh, thanks to both of our audiences for, for tuning in. Um, and there should be a video posted in a couple of days or so uh, with the, the event recorded as well. So thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.